Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories on YouTube. Tonight's story is Yuki Ona, as translated and edited by Lovecadi O'Hearn. This story comes from Hearn's Quiet Dawn, Stories and Studies of Strange Things, first published in 1904. Okay, team, this story has a couple of footnotes. I do think the idea of putting a little chime sound effect when there's a footnote on screen is a good idea, because most people are just listening to the story and can use the audio cue to look at the screen. I am aware that I did not do a good job of this last time, but also that story had a pile of footnotes right in a row at the beginning, so I can see why it would be especially annoying. I'm going to try it again and see if it goes better this time. As always, feedback is super helpful so that I can continue to make improvements over time, so please do let me know how it goes in the comments below. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. In the village of Musashi province, there lived two woodcutters, Masaku and Minokichi. At the time of which I am speaking, Mosaku was an old man, and Minokichi, his apprentice, was a lad of eighteen years. Every day they went together to a forest situated about five miles from their village. On the way to that forest there is a wide river to cross, and there is a ferry boat. Sometimes a bridge was built where the ferry is, but the bridge was each time carried away by a flood. No common bridge can resist the current there when the river rises. Mosaku and Minokichi were on their way home one very cold evening when a great snowstorm overtook them. They reached the ferry, and they found that the boatman had gone away, leaving his boat on the other side of the river. It was no day for swimming, and the woodcutters took shelter in the ferryman's hut, thinking themselves lucky to find any shelter at all. There was no brazier in the hut, nor any place in which to make a fire. It was only a two-mat hut with a single door, but no window. Mosaku and Minokichi fastened the door and lay down to rest, with their straw raincoats over them. At first they did not feel very cold, and they thought that the storm would soon be over. The old man almost immediately fell asleep, but the boy, Minokichi, lay awake a long time, listening to the awful wind and the continual slashing of the snow against the door. The river was roaring, and the hut swayed and creaked like a junk at sea. It was a terrible storm, and the air was every moment becoming colder, and Minokichi shivered under his raincoat. But at last, in spite of the cold, he too fell asleep. He was awakened by a showering of snow in his face. The door of the hut had been forced open, and, by the snow light, he saw a woman in the room, a woman all in white. She was bending above Musaku and blowing her breath upon him, and her breath was like a bright white smoke. Almost in the same moment, she turned to Minokichi and stooped over him. He tried to cry out, but found that he could not utter any sound. The white woman bent down over him, lower and lower, until her face almost touched him, and he saw that she was very beautiful, though her eyes made him afraid. For a little time, she continued to look at him. Then she smiled, and she whispered, I intended to treat you like the other man, but I cannot help feeling some pity for you, because you are so young. You are a pretty boy, Minokichi, and I will not hurt you now. But if you ever tell anybody, even your own mother, about what you have seen this night, I shall know it, and then I will kill you. Remember what I say. With these words, she turned from him and passed through the doorway. Then he found himself able to move, and he sprang up and looked out. But the woman was nowhere to be seen, and the snow was driving furiously into the hut. Minokichi closed the door and secured it by fixing several billets of wood against it. 
He wondered if the wind had blown it open. He thought that he might have been only dreaming, and might have mistaken the gleam of the snow light in the doorway for the figure of a white woman, but he could not be sure. He called to Mosaku, and was frightened because the old man did not answer. He put out his hand in the dark, and touched Mosaku's face, and found that it was ice. Mosaku was stark and dead. By dawn the storm was over, and when the ferryman returned to his station, a little after sunrise, he found Minokichi lying senseless beside the frozen body of Mosaku. Minokichi was promptly cared for, and soon came to himself, but he remained a long time ill from the effects of the cold of that terrible night. He had been greatly frightened also by the old man's death, but he said nothing about the vision of the woman in white. As soon as he got well again, he returned to his calling, going alone every morning to the forest and coming back at nightfall with his bundles of wood, which his mother helped him to sell. One evening, in the winter of the following year, as he was on his way home, he overtook a girl who happened to be traveling by the same road. She was a tall, slim girl, very good-looking, and she answered Minokichi's greeting in a voice as pleasant to the ear as the voice of a songbird. Then he walked beside her, and they began to talk. The girl said that her name was Oyuki, that she had lately lost both of her parents, and that she was going to Yedo, where she happened to have some poor relations who might help her to find a situation as a servant. Minochiki soon felt charmed by this strange girl, and the more that he looked at her, the handsomer she appeared to be. He asked her whether she was yet betrothed, and she answered, laughingly, that she was free. Then in her turn she asked Minochiki whether he was married or pledged to marry, and he told her that, although he had only a widowed mother to support, the question of an honorable daughter-in-law had not yet been considered, as he was very young. After these confidences, they walked on for a long while without speaking, but, as the proverb declares, Kiga areba me mokuchi hodo ni mono wo yu. When the wish is there, the eyes can say as much as the mouth. By the time they reached the village, they had become very much pleased with each other, and then Minokichi asked Oyuki to rest a while at his house. After some shy hesitation, she went there with him, and his mother made her welcome and prepared a warm meal for her. Oyuki behaved so nicely that Minokichi's mother took a sudden fancy to her and persuaded her to delay her journey to Yedo. And the natural end of the matter was that Yuki never went to Yedo at all. She remained in the house as an honorable daughter-in-law. Oyuki proved a very good daughter-in-law. When Minochiki's mother came to die, some five years later, her last words were words of affection and praise for the wife of her son. And Oyuki bore Minochiki ten children, boys and girls, handsome children, all of them, and very fair of skin. The country folk thought Oyuki a wonderful person, by nature different from themselves. Most of the peasant women age early, but Oyuki, even after having become the mother of ten children, looked as young and fresh as on the day when she had first come into the village. One night, after the children had gone to sleep, Oyuki was sewing by the light of a paper lamp, and Minokichi, watching her, said, To see you sewing there, with the light on your face, makes me think of a strange thing that happened when I was a lad of eighteen. I then saw somebody as beautiful and white as you are now. Indeed, she was very like you. Without lifting her eyes from her work, Oyuki responded, Tell me about her. Where did you see her? Then Minokichi told her about the terrible night in the ferryman's hut, and about the white woman that had stooped above him, smiling and whispering, and about the silent death of old Mosaku. And he said, Asleep or awake, that was the only time that I saw a being as beautiful as you. Of course, she was not a human being, and I was afraid of her, very much afraid. But she was so white. 
Indeed, I have never been sure whether it was a dream that I saw or the woman of the snow. Oyuki flung down her sewing and rose and bowed above Minokichi where he sat and shrieked into her face, It was I! I! Yuki it was! And I told you then that I would kill you if you ever said one word about it. But for those children asleep there, I would kill you this moment. And now you had better take very, very good care of them, for if ever they have reason to complain of you, I will treat you as you deserve. Even as she screamed, her voice became thin like a crying of wind, and then she melted into a bright white mist that spired to the roof beams and shuddered away through the smoke hole. Never again was she seen. The best sentence in this story is, The white woman bent down over him, lower and lower, until her face almost touched him, and he saw that she was very beautiful, though her eyes made him afraid. So... I can totally forgive him for telling the story. I mean, I can imagine that, you know, after a couple of decades go by and the fear has long passed and you're not even 100% sure that it wasn't a dream and you're hanging out at night alone with your wife, I would have told the story. And at the same time, I don't blame her. She told him not to tell anyone ever. And if he did, she would know. But serious question, do you guys think that he actually was wrong to tell? Let me know in the comments. You know, marrying him and having his children does seem like a kind of excessive way to spy on him his whole life. And Yuki Ona here is a good wife. Everyone likes her. They're impressed by her. Do you think really that staying home and cooking and sewing and parenting was, you know, kind of a calm down for her? I'm curious about her inner life and her motivations. What is the transition like from, like, living in the mountain woods and sucking out souls and howling around the icy cliffs toward this very domestic existence? Although she obviously did take parenthood very seriously, and she seems attached to him. This story also reminds me of the magic sword, where the guy brings home a ghost demon girl and the mom likes her so much and they get married and have kids. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a confession. Tonight's confession is that I was baking, dutifully following this recipe and doing everything right, and I just noticed the last line, allow brownies to cool completely before removing from pan. Outrageous! I'm supposed to sit around here with a pan full of warm brownies and not eat any? I had to step away from the kitchen to record a story in order to avoid temptation. <laughs> so, let's talk brownies in the comments this week. Do you like nuts, or are you a brownie purist? And please, if you know of a really good brownie recipe that is in metric, and I mean native to metric, not converted from imperial units, when you convert from imperial to metric, you're converting from volume to weight, which is never really accurate for baking. Anyway, if you have a good metric brownie recipe, please, please share it. And if you like ghost stories and brownies, you're in the right place. Every week I scour old literature looking for the best and most interesting stories to share with you. Please join my incredible team of 1,000 subscribers so you never miss a story. Please also drop me a like or a comment about stories or about brownies, and I will see you in a few days.